This mini lecture provides an introduction to the idea that information is visual. In the video, we are going to look very, very briefly at four things. We're going to look at data visualization, infographics, information design, and visual thinking. Now we're looking at these four things because they are either um, ways of representing data or information visually, or they are practices and disciplines that can inform the way we organize information visually. So information design and visual thinking are tools and strategies that can help you to implement the idea of information being visual. Now I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about data visualization, a bit more time looking at infographics. I'll talk extremely briefly about information design and give you some links in the description and in the resource page to allow you to explore that concept um, further. And I'll spend a little bit more time again on visual thinking because I think it's a really useful tool and may help you also with your assignment work. So let's get started. Images help us to sense make. They allow us to make sense of the world, to understand how things work and to help us map out our thoughts about things. They also help us to communicate with other people. They can allow us to unravel the complexity that often occurs in words and just in the world generally. They help us to clarify and they make information accessible. How do they do this? Well, there is a bit of science behind it. I hear this statement a lot. I'm not a visual person. Well, if you think you're not a visual person, I'm afraid that you might actually be wrong. We're all geared for effective and efficient processing of visual information. Together, the human eye and brain and the optic nerve that connects them are a really powerful processor for information. Science has never been my strong point, so I'm not going to attempt to explain the biology. You'll have to just believe me when I tell you that your brain is good at taking images and translating them into meaning. I've written some content related to this presentation, and there are links to that in the description box below. And there you'll find more information on the topic um, regarding how the brain processes information and why it's so good at it. Images transcend the divide of language. In fact, they can actually provide us with a common language. They're also the language of thought. When I say a word, you see an image of that word and what it represents in your mind. So you don't actually see the word, you see the thing that it represents. I'll talk more about this a little later. But for now, consider the opportunities offered by using an image rather than a word or images in place of words. So why is there all this talk about visualization and infographics right now? Well, we are living in a world um, and a time where information is everywhere and there is so much of it. We can often have a sense that we are drowning in the information torrent and visual information can help us to find an anchor and to make sense of complex information. We're also living in the age of open data, where research bodies like the ARC are mandating that researchers make their data available for open access after the project. Governments are looking at how they can make open data available as well. So there is all this data around as a result of the open data movement. In addition to that, big data is huge right now, and this is related to the open data movement, although not all big data, of course, is open. But big data is really a buzzword right now, and it's, a, um, it's an area that is in great demand, and it's an area that is growing incredibly quickly. There's also been a proliferation of tools that allow people to quickly and easily create things like visualizations and infographics. And that has also had an impact on the amount of visual information being created and the buzz around visual information. So I'm gonna begin now by talking about visualization. Data visualization is essentially the graphical representation of data. It sits at the nexus of a couple of different disciplines, specifically communication, information science, and design. Visualizations communicate data in visual form. 
And we know that's a good thing because we know the brain processes visual information efficiently. But the value of visualizations transcends making linear data available in visual form. So it goes beyond just turning those numbers into images. Visualizations also allow data to be brought together from different sources, allowing data to be contextualized by other data, essentially mashing data up together to create something that didn't exist before. For example, this spreadsheet of 20th century death data has been collated from a number of different sources, pulling together data on causes of death over time. The spreadsheet contains close to 400 rows and more than a dozen columns. This data in this form is incomprehensible, at least to me, except at the very detailed level when you're looking at a single line. I can understand a single line or even a small set of lines, but I can't get an overarching view of the data and see it all in context. And it's that overarching view that becomes really important when there is such a proliferation of information and indeed data. So enter visualization. This visualization is based on the chart that we just saw. It comes from the site Information is Beautiful and it takes the data that was in that chart and represents it in visual form. Suddenly, we can see the data in context and we can compare the size of the circles and get a sense of what's actually happening in the data. Following this video, I've added another video to the playlist, which is not a video I've created. It's a video called 200 Countries, 200 Years and 4 Minutes. So we've talked about visualization briefly and defined what that is. Now let's move on to our second type of visual information representation, infographics. Infographics present stories in visual form. Sometimes the data in an infographic comes from a single source, but often they take data from multiple sources, sometimes doing a bit of a meta-analysis, but more often just collating different data together. Um, but the idea is that the data is curated and presented in a way that tells a story. Infographics are self-contained, so they have all the information needed in them to tell their specific story. You don't have to go off elsewhere and find information to help you understand what's, in, what's going on in the infographic. Infographics and visualizations are different things. Infographics can contain visualizations, but visualizations um, don't contain infographics. So I'm going to read this quote to you here about the difference between infographics and visualizations because it sums it up clearly and concisely. This quote comes from a blog post by Jack Hagley and I'll include the link to that post in the description box below and also on the information page on the unit site. So here it is. The difference between them can perhaps be also thought of as the difference between data and information. Information is refined data, just as an infographic could be thought of as a refined data visualization. Both hopefully lead us to the still more refined state, knowledge. So in an infographic, we are working with something that is more refined and more processed than data. It's information. But in a visualization, we're working with just the data, the raw data. And ultimately, both of them should be leading us to be more informed and more knowledgeable. So infographics can come in a number of different formats. They come in videos, they come in images, and sometimes even there are interactive ones as well. I'm not going to show you a video or interactive example here because we don't really have time in this short video to do that. Um, but I will show you an image-based infographic and we'll look at some more examples in the next video where we look at DIY infographics. So here is one infographic that I pinned a while back when I was doing my PhD research looking at how new mothers use social media. So this is just um, an infographic using data from Nielsen, I believe. And on the left hand side, you can see the whole infographic. And on the right hand side, you can see um, where I've just zoomed into one section of the infographic. So often they'll have discrete sections within them, but always the information is presented in a visual format and the idea is to make it accessible 
and to take advantage of the common language that we have in visuals. So a good infographic tells a story really clearly and concisely through the visual representation of data. But what we need to recognise is that not all infographics are created equal. Some of them don't tell a coherent story, some don't tell the story effectively, and some use data in ways that is questionable, either misinterpreting the data, misrepresenting the data, or leaving out part of the story. Right now, a vast number of infographics are being created every day. A proliferation of those click to publish um, tools online allows anyone to create an infographic. And that means that we need to be a little bit wary and reflect critically on the data and the way it's used whenever we're looking at infographics. So I'm going to show you a couple of examples here of bad infographics found in an article called 16 Useless Infographics. Again, the link will be in the description box and I recommend you have a read of the article. It's quite interesting. So here we have um, a infographic related to design, which is quite ironic because this infographic it's, itself is pretty ineffectively um, designed. It's very, very busy. It's difficult to understand the relationships between things and it's just represented in a way that is not particularly accessible. Let's look at another example. This one is an image that I've recreated because the quality of the image wasn't very good when I blew it up. So this is a cake graphic, but it um, is basically a representation of what was in the original. So um, what's wrong with this particular infographic? Well, it says 76% um, of the extreme poor live in rural areas. And the problem with this graphic is that that's not 76% on the pie chart. Neither of those circles are 76%. 76% um, should be just more than three quarters. Now this one also has something odd going on with the way the proportions are represented. So again, something happening with sizes here. So this infographic tells us that um, there has been an increase in the number of nurses recruited in New South Wales. Um, it's factually correct, right? The data is actually correct. It has gone from 43,406 to 46,573. But what the problem here is, is that in 2010-11, there are four people there to represent 43,000 nurses. But when that number jumps up, they've actually added 28 more stick people to represent an increase of only 3,000 a year. So really going on these, the scale that was used for those first three years on the chart, there shouldn't even be half a person added, let alone 28. So this is a misrepresentation of the data. It was a 7% increase, whereas what we see here looks like a 700% increase. This could be an error, Perhaps it was deliberate, but the point is that if you're going to use visuals to represent something, you need to be consistent and make sure that you're using those images in a consistent way that um, represents what is actually going on in the data. So um, that's a bit of background about infographics. Now let's move on to talk extremely briefly about information design. Information design is um, a discipline um, the practices of which underpin lots of what we've been talking about in this video related to visual information. As a discipline, information design looks at, unsurprisingly, designing information with a focus on presenting information that is intelligible, easy to understand, and fosters the transfer of meaning. It's related to fields like graphic design, and it's related to visualization, and in some ways it's related to infographics, but it's not actually those things. Um, it is something different. It's not about aesthetics either. It's about uh, function and functionality and arranging information um, in a way that allows people to be informed. So the focus is on informing people. 
one of the things that information design does is it looks at how to position information in context of other information so that you can kind of see the full picture. Information design has probably come onto people's radars um, more in the last little while because of the widespread use of infographics, but it's actually a lot more than infographics. It's a whole discipline in itself and it's a very important discipline. Um, and it is one that should really be applied to information in all formats that it comes in, text, images, whatever. So that was a really brief discussion of um, information design. It could have a whole lecture on its own, but it's not the focus of what we're doing here today. I just want you to be a bit aware of um, the discipline and the fact that it exists. And you can also go off and do your own reading. And I've also collated some links for you. So in addition to um, information design, visualizations and infographics, I also wanted to talk about visual thinking in this video. So visual thinking um, helps us to organize our thoughts and our ideas. Uh, people don't think from start to finish. We don't think in a linear way. We tend to think in um, a much more fluid way. Our brains will, will do one thing and then we'll jump off and do something else and we'll head off on tangents or we'll go off onto completely different paths. If you think, for example, about the way you work in any given day, if you're anything like me, you'll probably get to the end of the day and realize you've opened up 50 browser tabs that you um, kind of opened so that you would do something with them and immediately forgot about. And you might have five half answered emails open on your desktop. Um, and that happens because our brains flit from thing to thing to thing all day. Um, and that can be quite difficult to deal with when you're trying to um, order your thoughts. So what I do a lot is make lists. So I'm trying to organize my thoughts, but um, I'm organizing them in a linear way, uh, in a list, and language itself is quite linear. Um, but the way we think just isn't linear at all. So when we rely on these linear methods like lists and language to organize our thinking, it actually constricts us and can put limits around um, what we kind of allow ourselves to think about and how we can actually um, grab all those thoughts and organize them well. So when we're writing, we typically think through one path or train of thought without pursuing all of the offshoots or going off on all of the tangents of related ideas that we come up with. Unless you have a writing process that allows you to do that, um, which it is possible to develop, um, it can be really difficult to let yourself go off and, and explore those other thoughts. So when we break out of this linear writing format, when we start thinking about how we can actually express ourselves in information, we start to remove some of the constraints um, around our thinking and the way we kind of force ourselves to think from the beginning of the sentence to the end of the sentence. So if you can get rid of those constraints, you can pursue tangents and those nebulous ideas will often be developed. So even if all you do is organize linear words in a non-linear way, like getting a mind map and putting words on the page, you're still giving yourself a bit more freedom to take off in different places and in different directions with your thinking. So I mentioned earlier that um, words have images associated with them. And here is an example. So the reason that visual thinking is so powerful, other than that it can help us unravel complexity, is that it allows us to translate what we see in our heads into something on the page. So if I say dog, you don't see the letters D-O-G in your head, you see a picture of a dog. So if we have to translate the images in our head into letters on the page, we actually can lose some of the meaning in the translation. So I might say dog, but in my head, I can see a particular dog, a fluffy dog, a little dog, you know, a particular type of dog, a dog with muddy paws. So there's so much more in the image we see in our heads than can be conveyed in a single word. So if we think in pictures, it makes sense to me that our sense making process um, can be effectively done in pictures so that sense making is a really useful way for us to work through our ideas. 
So for example, I sense make every presentation I give by creating the visuals. I start making the slide deck as soon as I start working on the presentation itself. So before I even have a clear idea of what I'm doing. I generally try to come up with a theme for the presentation or a concept for how it will look or be framed. And then I start making the slides to make sense of what I'm doing. I generally don't know where the presentation will end up um, until I get to the last slide. So I build a narrative as I create. I often mind map as I go, um, and I've been known to turn these mind maps into my presentation visuals, which I'll show you in a moment. But the process of creating the presentation, um, it might seem a linear process because I'm working on slides in order, but often what I'll do is I'll choose images and put things together and then move them around within the presentation. And it's the visual process, the process of creating a visual story that actually helps me to work out what I'm gonna say. So I just mentioned that sometimes I will turn my mind maps into a presentation material. Um, so visual thinking isn't just great for the thinking stuff. It's also a great way to communicate your ideas to others. So some of the tools that we use in visual thinking can help us to um, get other people to understand what we're saying. So we know images provide a common language and we know that our brains are geared to process visual information fast. If we make a list or write a paper or even talk through our ideas without the support of a visual, it's difficult to get people to understand the relationships between our ideas. Um, and it's harder for them to have an overarching view of how it all fits together. Particularly where you have a complex um, issue or a complex topic or there's lots of threads weaved through. In those instances, um, visuals can be really helpful and the visuals that you create through visual thinking in particular can be helpful. So the products of visual thinking are incredibly useful for communicating with others. So some of the tools that we can use for visual thinking and representing our ideas and thoughts visually are things that we've already talked about in this video, like infographics and visualizations. But there are some other tools that are really useful too, like diagrams, but in particular, I'm interested in sketch notes and mind maps. Now I wanted to talk to you about these concepts, but uh, this video would be huge if I did. So instead, I am going to create a separate optional video that you can watch about sketch notes and mind maps, and I'll be showing you some examples from around the internet and also some examples of how I've used mind maps um, to create presentations. There'll be a link to that video in the description box for this one. Okay, so this video has provided a really quick introduction to data visualization. Um, it's told you what it is and how it works and why it's useful. We've done the same with infographics, had a really brief orientation to information design, and we've also talked about visual thinking. There is a follow-up video to this one which is more practical, so it um, builds on this video and looks at how you can create infographics yourself. And in particular, I'm gonna run through some tools and techniques that you can use, and this will be really useful for your persona poster assignment. I've also been sneaky and embedded your homework in the second video. So make sure you watch the Hans Rosling video next and then go on and watch the DIY infographics video um, and do your activities for this week. If you've got any questions about this video, please pop them in the comments and I'll get back to you as soon as I can.